Welcome to The Carlina Show, where ordinary people share their hero's journey. I'm your host, Carlina Angwin, and this is episode 28 of the podcast. Today on the show, we have Anthony Kane. Anthony is a licensed funeral director and death expert based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. From our conversation today, you'll notice Anthony brings warmth and humor to the tough topic of mortality and what happens after we die. You can visit the Carlina Show website at carlina.net to learn more about Anthony and link to the show notes. From there, you can find past episodes, connect on social media, and sign up for the mailing list. Thank you, Stephen Lorca, for video editing and production. And now I bring you Anthony Kane. So, uh, so did you go to school for to be a funeral director? I did. I, I went to school to to do funeral service uh, studies, and and at that time it was funny to me because I had just graduated from Millersville University in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, which with a bachelor's degree. And all my friends were heading back to school for their masters. In, in Pennsylvania, funeral service education is only a certificate or an associate's. So here I was going back to school for a lesser degree than I just got. What did um, what degree but, did you get in your bachelor's? I, I was a bachelor's of science, industry, and technology with a minor in graphic design from okay. Millersville University. Okay. But yes, I went to Northampton Community College for funeral services, and there are only two schools in the whole state that provide such education. And so there's Northampton Community College, and then there's Pittsburgh Institute of Mortuary Science, obviously in Pittsburgh, which is very private, very well respected, but a lot more money than I had and that I wanted to spend. Mm -hmm. So I went the community college route for the same, same degree, and it worked out very well. And so what led you to that field? When I lived in and grew up in Gettysburg, there was a very prominent family uh, funeral home business that everybody used. I, I just happened to land a summer job there when I was 16 years old, uh, just because I wanted to do something very different and unique. I always kind of took out experiences that, that were different than most kids were doing. Like I didn't want to work in a restaurant. I didn't want to fold clothes at the Gap. Um, I actually first wanted to do like uh, sanitation or or garbage for a summer, but I was not of age. I just thought that would be such a good experience to to see that line of work. But Mm -hmm. through my father and through one of his old high school classmates who was a part of this family, I got a job with them. And um, they were just tremendous people some of the nicest people that i adults even that that i had ever met and they were gracious to me they were very gentle with me in the the death you know world of being brand new and me not having any experience in it and not to mention gettysburg is a small community so about 30 percent of the services we had even in that three months of summer were people that i knew so, I mean, that that was crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Tell me about, you know, what what was that like when you first started? Was it an internship? Is that what you said? It, well, when I was 16, I, so I didn't, I wasn't heavily involved with preparation of bodies or anything like that. What I was mostly doing at 16 was cutting the grass, washing the cars. I had a driver's license, so that summer was actually a drought. Um, summer, so we were not permitted to use a hose or anything like that. So I actually drove the cars to the car wash uh, where it was recycled water and um, polished brass, vacuumed, things like that. But they did start introducing me to helping dress people to prepare for viewings, uh, which was different. Um, I'm somebody that never liked to touch or pick up a dead animal. If, If you came across a a squirrel or a mouse in the yard or a bird somewhere odd as you do, you know, just living life. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to touch it. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But, but I found that the dead human remains were very different in that everybody had a story that, that you could hear by talking to their other families. And for some reason, for me, that made it 
more acceptable or or not as as scary or creepy to touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just didn't like the touch of like fur or anything. So uh-huh. there's like a fur coat. I don't want to touch it. And uh-huh. I still don't want to touch it. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was just very different. And I I just think that through their community service and how happy everybody was to see them, even in the worst of circumstances, it really put my mind at ease. Mm-hmm. Uh, even, even though at a 16 year old, I was still like, man, what am I doing? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, maybe I should fold sweaters at Gap. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> were there any, were there any families or situations that, that surprised you or that, that you still think about now? From yeah. There? In fact, actually one of, one of the funeral services that I was a part of working was that of our next door neighbor, uh, <laughs> which mm-hmm. was very strange, but. Uh, another fantastic area family, uh, the matriarch, the mother of the family, had battled uh, brain cancer for a good two years on and off and treatment and everything and just finally had succumbed to uh, the cancer metastasizing in other parts of her body. But um, that that was weird. And it was like the last funeral that I did that summer. So it was a exclamation point on on kind of the idea of if I wanted to do this in, in the future or not. Um, but that, that experience was kind of out of body because I wanted to be a normal person at that funeral because it was my neighbor. Uh-huh. But I had done it for three months and I sort of felt like I can't just sit here. I want to be behind the scenes um, helping because that's how I can help this family. Uh-huh. And I think that is what stuck with me the most and is probably why I put funeral service in the back of my mind, uh, you know, at that age, thinking I might want to do something with it in the future, Uh probably because of that experience. And as you talk to funeral directors and even students in class um, in the funeral service education programs out there, and you ask them, how did you come to funeral service? One of the things that they'll say is they'll always have one experience or one death. That, that pulled them in. It could be a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a girlfriend, boyfriend. But mm-hmm. one by one, you hear that it's because somebody they were close to passed away and mm-hmm. they just felt, they felt relieved by helping in mm-hmm. some way. And that led them to funeral service. Yeah. And I think that, that's true of me. Yeah. When you went to um, undergrad, did you go with the anticipation of going, uh, getting into funeral uh, services later on, or would you? Did you have something else in mind when you first started out? And truthfully, when I started undergrad, and this is hindsight being twenty twenty, I probably should have waited a full year before I even started college uh-huh. because my uh, my major freshman year was definitely nothing academic. <laughs> so. Uh-huh. So I don't think I was thinking about anything too much uh, at that time. It wasn't until I actually graduated and started working in the real world. Um, I I was working for a minor league professional baseball team in the front office doing human resources and payroll things, Uh um, which had nothing at all to do with anything I went to Millersville for in the first place. But Uh uh, it was there that I realized, man, you really are going to have to work if you want to make any money at all um, in this line of work, because I was kind of capped at $27,500 in 2006. Uh (laughs) I was like, oh my God, Uh I need to do something because I don't think I can be here. I don't know what else to do. And I just kind of did what most people do and thought about going back to school for something. Uh And, And that was in the back of my mind. And I like to say that it, kind of jogged forward mm-hmm. um <laughs> yeah it took, it took a path <laughs> and that's what I did I went back to school so what is the what is so it's a two-year program well since I had a bachelor's degree it was only a one-year program um for somebody just starting out um since it is an associate's program it used to be now I don't know what it is today but it was 90 credits mm-hmm. um and and that Really, 112 is about a bachelor's degree. So Uh I'm not sure why the state doesn't just decide that it should be a bachelor's degree and just Uh have them do two more semesters. Uh Um, 
it's kind of silly. Other states, it's about a full bachelor's degree. So tell me what the what that training is like. Um, is it mostly in the classroom? Did they take you out in the field? Um, and then tell me a little bit also about the the other students. So the the education and training can be both. Um, so you had asked if it was out in the fields and, and in the classroom. So one of the things that you, you were tasked to do, if you could, was find a field study place. Uh, so that would be another funeral home to which you could do your required hours per month. And once you enter a certain course, which would have been embalming um, two, so we would have exited just the, the theory of embalming and talked more about the practice of it uh, in the second part of that course, then you were required to do so many embalmings um, a month during that course. Uh Uh, So I did that. I found a field placement. I actually worked there every day um, while I was in school. And I wound up living there, uh, which is a crazy story in and of itself. You lived at the funeral home? (laughs) I lived at the funeral home. Tell me about that. (laughs) Well, I I certainly will. Let me just explain. (laughs) One, other students that couldn't find a field study, there was lab opportunity at school. Mm-hmm. And they would mostly work with uh, the county coroner with unclaimed individuals who, after a certain amount of time, they couldn't locate any family. Their their remains had to be dealt with. So those students were, and I'm going to say this, stuck with with embalming them. They were never very good cases. Wow, but, were, they, were they homeless people? It, it could be. I mean, I certainly, even when I was licensed and practicing, had a case where somebody died. And um, the coroner, which is an extension of the police, uh-huh. did find family who hated this individual so much they refused to do anything. Uh-huh. So this person's time, I think it was about 60 days that they have. I mean, they, Philadelphia really doesn't have that much time to be dealing with. Um, there's a lot of you know heroin and important police cases that they're, they're working on, heroin deaths and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I've lost my train, but yes, it does happen. It's it's very sad, and usually what happens then is the county is tasked with finding a funeral home or a place where they can dispose of the remains by cremation. Uh-huh. And then, again, the cremated remains sit for an amount of time before they're placed in a, in a cemetery that is gracious enough to have consigned to earth. Um, Mm -hmm. what that means is nobody wants a cremated remains. They cannot be thrown, thrown away. Consigned to earth means buried, but, um, no record and and no family notification. Okay. So, yeah. So these were, so some of your classmates did this. So yeah, some of them did the, uh, like the lab work. Mm -hmm. Um, most of us that were able to find field studies and, and have jobs at other funeral homes, um, wound up leaving school with a better sense of what the embalming process was, mm-hmm. especially for uh, funeral service presentation, viewings, and things like that, because you were constantly working on normal cases. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would have circulatory systems that were well intact, uh, bodies with without much putrefaction or any other kind of signs of decay, um, whereas the other... 60 day would be in refrigeration, but um, refrigeration only slows down the spread of uh, Clostridium perfringens, which is the bacteria that start in your uh, digestive system. And it, mm-hmm. it just it creates gas and green and just all sorts of nasty things. Yeah. But, but because of that, your arteries are very, very thin muscle walls and they break down very, very quickly. So mm-hmm. those poor students, when they were embalming, never really got very good good results. And that's frustrating because the only way to learn is to see how that embalming progresses through the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you can't see that, you don't know <laughs> you're doing a good job. Yeah. So, so I, I was lucky not to have to be part of that. Yeah. Um, so the, your classmates all had their internships at different places and then you would get back together in the classroom and dis- and discuss um 
what you had observed or what you had experienced. Is that kind of how it worked? Yes. And also the um, program director and another instructor would do site visits. So once a month they would come and, and kind of interview your preceptors, uh, the people that were teaching you uh, everything and, and kind of get a sense of the student's progress. Um, for me, that was never nerve wracking because I just have this way of finding good people. Mm-hmm. And the family that I worked with in Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, are people that I love very dearly and I still keep in contact with. I, I consider them my like foster family because they really did foster me through what is actually a very tough emotional roller coaster of, of learning um, because you only get one shot at uh, performing these services for people. And, and it does feel like an awful lot of weight is on your shoulders to to do it the right way because that's someone's mom or, or wife or mm-hmm. child. You know, I mean, it's there's really no margin for for error. And if you don't care about that, you shouldn't be doing it. Mm-hmm. Can you give me an example of a couple of the funerals you did during that internship that stick with you? Sure. There, there was a young girl about 17 years old who was in a, I'm not sure if it was a, a juvenile detention center or if it was a regular rehabilitation center, but she was there because she was a heroin addict, addict. I um, don't want to pronounce things incorrectly, mm-hmm. but... Um, so she was there and she and one of her friends that she had met in that program um, were on methadone and they had concocted a scheme to steal some and, and have a really big, big night. Um, mm-hmm. Well, she wound up overdosing. And I'm not sure if it was methadone or if, if they got a hold of something else, but she overdosed in the rehab program. Mm. And at that time, I was 24 years old. This girl was only 17, and I think the death didn't bother me. Her coming in didn't really bother me, but what really bothered me was her friends that came to the service Um, because there I was staring at people that were only four or five years behind me in school. You know, Mm -hmm. when you really think of it that way, they were just one whole process of either college or high school behind. So Uh it still felt really current to me. Um, But she was, uh, when somebody overdoses, they're always autopsy. If somebody's found somewhere along the road or, or anything, they're always autopsy. And then I actually just recently learned why, because I always felt like, man, if there's a heroin kit on the car seat next to them, duh, it's why they died. They OD'd, right? Uh Uh-huh. But the coroner has a responsibility to do an autopsy to try to find anything that might link that death to other deaths that they find find to create a case. If they ever catch the dealer or the distributor, they have 30 counts of of murder or, you know, whatever. So I kind of understood why Mm -hmm. that was. I I always just kind of thought that it was mutilation and it didn't help the funeral homes. It didn't help the families. Mm-hmm. Um, to know that that their person was going to be examined in in that thorough kind of way that that actually is very disruptive to the to the body, but I understand it now. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was autopsy. Um, it was an open ca- casket, so you know we did the normal embalming prep. But I'll, I'll just never forget the the sobs, the screaming, the disbelief of people coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, thankfully, one of the things that I did hear, um, my responsibility when I was a student at working a service like that was mostly door and or helping people park. Um, but when people would leave a viewing, they always talk about what they saw inside before they would get in cars to, mm-hmm. to leave. Mm-hmm. And I always put on my elephant ear to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, that service, I was extremely proud because some people were trying to find all those different demarcations of her trauma you know especially the post you know post uh, death trauma from the autopsy and nobody could find anything and that she looked so great so Mm -hmm. you know it's kind of proud but I thought about that for a long time what were some of the things that you heard people say when they were leaving the funeral home 
Oh, a, a lot of times people equate uh, somebody looking good at a viewing with uh, it looks like they could just get out of the casket. It's something that you hear repeatedly. Mm-hmm. Or like they're just sleeping. And I heard a lot of that that night. Um, I heard somebody joke that this is probably a prank and she's you know, going to say gotcha at the end of the service or something like that, which I don't think any funeral home would agree to. Uh-huh. But you just hear, and it really comes down to disbelief. People don't want to believe. Uh-huh. Um, and in some ways, viewings are detrimental to that because it does give people that feeling of uh, this is foolery or some kind of trick. Uh-huh. Um, but in other ways, it helps people realize that this did happen. Um, people would really realize it happened if it didn't look so good, but that's just not the way our society works. Mm-hmm. Um, that's more how it used to work. Right. And, and, and maybe it should be more like that, but it just isn't at the moment. Did it change the way you think about how you want your funeral? I mean, if you wanted an open casket or... Uh, I can certainly say now that I I think people can put all their wishes down on paper and talk about it and decide whether they want a viewing, a burial, a cremation, um, any of those kind of options. But it's I've kind of submitted myself to the idea that if if I go first, my wife will be able to do whatever it is that she sees fit because we're not going to know uh-huh. and, and funerals are for the living. They're not, they're not for the dead. And I, I don't really subscribe to finding an importance that there's a, a shell or a body left behind. Um, so I personally would like to be cremated, but I also think that if I die at this age, um, I'm 36 right now. I had to think, Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that that might be a little different and that maybe there should be a viewing mm-hmm. and you can still be cremated if you're embalmed and have a viewing but uh, a lot of people would want like my parents would need a grave mm-hmm. they just would so I, I would and I better have this discussion but I, I would say that, that Meg should probably go forward with a burial of me at this time mm-hmm. um, for, for my parents sake Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but truthfully, I don't care. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna say. I've heard people say, "Just throw me in a garbage bag," but <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that crude. Um, I find that people have high value, and I know that I do, even if I don't feel that all the time mm-hmm. uh, to myself. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's go back to your to your training. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we move on and talk about? Um, employment uh yeah i think um that in my training i certainly had enough cases for me to realize that man this this body prep thing this embalming thing it isn't as scientific as as we've learned it's more of an art um it's one of those processes where there's a hundred ways to do one thing and all of those hundred ways are are right as long as they produce the result that you're looking for Uh and for instance, um, I, I did have some opportunity to be creative and figure out some problems, even in my training. One of those was a low caliber suicide in a home in a basement with a rifle. And the angle of the wound was under the left mandible and out right above the right eye. So it was a very strange angle to be able to fire a long rifle. Um, but but he had managed to do so. But the exit wound produced a hole about the size of... Uh, do you remember those training pencils for kindergartners that were double thick? Yeah. Yeah, it produced a hole about that size. Wow. So uh, the my preceptor tasked me with figuring out a way to make it so that that hole wasn't visible. So no one would have an idea of anything that happened Uh because a lot of the times the the people don't mention suicide until after and a lot of the times it's rumor um people are afraid to talk to families about it families are afraid to talk about it Uh there's there's this 
unfortunate shame that goes with it. But, you know, my wife's a psychiatrist and I've had a lot of discussions with her. Suicide can be the ends to a very long battle with a disease called depression. Mm-hmm. And and it's a it's a shame that it happens. It's not always the reason why suicides happen, but I've stopped blaming the person. Yeah, you know, because you don't you don't blame somebody from dying from breast cancer or colon cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, but that you know that's beside the point. So to treat this wound, what I did was I got a feminine product, a tampon. Mm-hmm. And I went ahead and I injected the, the cotton into the hole and I got a razor blade. So I put the tampon in about an inch and a half. And I did that because, as you know, the cotton in a tampon has a super absorbent wicking action. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to give it enough length to wick any kind of fluid that might uh, pool or, or puddle in, in that area. Uh, we did a lot of um, aspiration to make sure there wasn't any fluid in there, but gravity does its own thing, and you know liquid does its own thing, Mm -hmm. so you can never be sure. But I I got a razor blade, and then I cut the tampon off to be flush, uh, with with the uh, surface of the skin. I then used what what morticians or funeral directors call, uh, forming wax, and I went ahead my surface, and I kind of like a dentist would fill in a cavity with amalgam. I put that wax on, and I heated it up with a, a, a hot uh, spoon, actually. So I, I got a little bit of a candle. I lit the candle. I put the spoon over the flame for just a second, and then I used it to, to rub on the wax. Now, you know when wax melts, it gets really smooth. Well, that doesn't look like skin. So I had to get a very stiff makeup brush, get, heat the spoon up again, mm-hmm. swipe it over that wax, and then I stippled the, the brush over, over the wax to get, like, pores. Mm-hmm. And then we used opaque makeup and then, like, Maybelline or something. And honest to God, you couldn't tell. Wow. I mean, th- thankfully, it, it wasn't a big wound, so you didn't really have to do anything super fancy. But, mm-hmm. but I was proud of that. And my boss came back, and he said, did, did you fix it? And I said, yeah, have a look. And he said, well, where is it? And I said, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Uh, the family wrote a nice note, too, uh, after the service, thanking. And it just kind of gave them one level of protection from discussion um, at the service, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you notice, uh, do, are funerals where someone died by suicide are are they different than other funerals i mean do you notice differences i'll tell you the biggest difference i noticed once i started working with families more directly as in being my own license and kind of the boss of my own self mm-hmm. um, i noticed that when a family experienced a suicide it most likely wasn't their first um they, they tend to run in families and I actually met a very good friend of mine now um, this way when when her father committed suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, it was her brother had committed su- committed suicide a couple years prior. And uh, the funny thing about her father was that nobody really saw it coming because he was so popular, uh, very popular in, in his circle of friends and even in the city of Philadelphia, well known one of my bigger services Mm -hmm. um but it it just dealing with the suicides again after talking with my wife just made me understand that depression doesn't always present itself in a way of reclusiveness or uh you know down in the dumps people can appear very happy and have a normal life it's the moments when they're alone that are the torture Mm -hmm. um and I, I just kind of learned that. And she helped me understand that. And her losing her father was very hard. Um, but I think it also helped her that I was the age that I was. We were, we were about the same age. So this would have been in 2013 or 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was 31 at the time. And she was also the same 
same age. We both lived down in the city um, in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And just after the service, we kind of still communicated and, and we've gone to dinner a few times. Now she's actually uh, very high up in the suicide prevention organization here locally. And from time to time needs advice from funeral director and, and I'm her I'm her reference. So mm-hmm. what kind of advice? Uh, just how to get information to people better. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, pamphlets are great, but we're in the age of the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, so how can people find the suicide resources and how to find help and especially the grief, uh, you know, after a suicide, after any death, people are in your face. They want you to know they're there. They want to talk to you and make sure you know they're there. And then they disappear after the service. They're afraid to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's even worse after suicide because people blame people for it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of course he killed suicide. Look at her. Or, you know, of course she killed herself. He's a jerk or, you know, mm-hmm. it ju- it's just, it's hard. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I helped her achieve or find was I think one of the best places for people to find out information is at a funeral home, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, so I got her a resource that listed every funeral home in every state. Um, so <laughs> there, yeah. there's a, a lot of books like that out there where every funeral home is listed because people die in other states and want to be brought back to Pennsylvania or they die in Pennsylvania and want to be buried in California. You just need a reference like that so that you can call other facilities and right. and set shipping and mm-hmm. things like that. Okay. So after the, was it a, a year you said you were in the uh, funeral services program? Yes. Okay. And so how <laughs> soon after that did you, did you find a job um, as a funeral director? So Pennsylvania requires you to be a student trainee so you have to get licensed through the state to be a student trainee then after that student trainee is is over you may renew it but you have to sit for your national boards first Mm -hmm. so you sit for nationals then that allows you to take an internship anywhere so pennsylvania you have to do an internship of one year after graduation Mm -hmm. and it can't start until you sit for your boards you don't have to pass your boards. You just have to sit at least once. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, I passed everything on the first try. But, you know, tests are stressful for some. And it doesn't matter how proficient you are. Sometimes you just mm-hmm. get inside your own self there. But mm-hmm. So then, then you do your year internship in Pennsylvania. And you have a required amount of families that you have to serve. Embalmings that you have to do. They make you keep kind of a journal and tick off I think it was like 30 you have to be the primary funeral director for 30 families do 30 embalmings removals Um, a removal is is when you go to the location where the body is and you make the transfer so you transfer that individual back to the funeral hall and where is the body where are the bodies usually so if somebody dies at home which is happening a lot more these days because of hospice, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then the family would call the hospice nurse and they would come to the home and pronounce them dead. Then they can call the funeral home and the funeral home can come to the home mm-hmm. and, and start working with the family and bring the person back to the funeral home. If somebody dies at home or anywhere else where it's a surprise, um, a lot of the times at, at, in a home, um, the coroner is called or the police are called. So 911, when the body's found, mm-hmm. they'll look at the surrounding area and see if they have any cause or reason for investigation. If that is a yes, then the coroner takes control of the body and then we're called after they're through with their process. If they get there and the person's 89 years old and it seems fairly normal for a natural cause, then the funeral home is called after they get the clearance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then we'll go to the home. If somebody passes away in a nursing home, then the nursing home calls the funeral home directly. And a lot of people are required to give the name of a funeral home when they um, either move into like 
uh, healthcare part of the nursing facility or, you know, cause there's the community is a single home living and, mm-hmm. and then there's like the medical wing in that facility. Mm-hmm. So we would go to a nursing home, a hospital, uh, same thing. There's usually a central holding facility. Everyone knows the term morgue. Um, mm-hmm. all hospitals have one, mm-hmm. uh, every funeral home would go deal with the hospital in the way that they require. A lot of the times you call security. Security takes your medical records, you pick up the death certificate, then you go with security down to the morgue, and then you make the transfer. Mm -hmm. Um, If somebody dies unexpectedly somewhere, like in a park, in a car accident, those are always going to be coroner cases. Never would a funeral home remove a body from uh, the park or from the site of a car accident or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're, we're kind of spared... That so, kind of so would that be part of your responsibility then? Would be to go to the 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 body in all of these different locations and talk to the family and talk to the police or the coroner and then transport the body to the funeral home? Yes, um, a lot of the times, if the coroner accepts the case as one of their own, then you're working with them on a one to one with getting all the information in order for the death certificate to register the death with the state. Mm-hmm. Um, if um, you're, you, when you're going to the home and it's hospice, a, a lot of the times the hospice program will let the family know the progress of, of the patient. So they'll say, look, uh, you know, we've been preparing for this, but I think in the next 48 hours, uh, this individual is going to die. And then they start calling the funeral home. So we, a lot of the times, have a heads up that we may be getting a call in the next day or two. Mm-hmm. Um, so we start uh, preparing the family for everything that they're about, about to do. And a lot of the times they want to come in and sit down and go through all the, the paperwork and just to get it out of the way because it is a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time you're done with a funeral arrangement, people always say, man, this is like buying a house because you're <laughs> signing so many different papers. So. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, we work with the hospice facilities too, because a lot of the times those doctors are the ones that are going to be issuing our death certificate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. too. So, so how many years have have you been a funeral director? Ten, licensed ten years. Okay, okay. And what are what are some some instances or some stories? that kind of stick with you over those last, those 10 years? I think the most recent ones are the ones that, that have affected me the most. And, and that's for one reason. Um, my wife and I had a son uh, in May of 2017. So it's very, very recent where he's mm-hmm. going to turn to. I didn't understand human emotion as well as I do now after his birth. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like, <laughs> you know, uh, I had an old boss at the baseball stadium I mentioned who used to say, my wife got pregnant and then I got fat and emotional. <laughs> That's exactly what's happened. I mean, I can't, <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I put on like 40 pounds after this kid was born and they're a good happy pounds, but uh-huh. man, a day. <laughs> but so I think one of the service that, that I just really can't get over. And I'm sure it's some degree, or it's exactly PTSD. Um, this, this family that I had worked with twice before. So I had gotten to know them really well through the two services. Um, it was a, a grandparent, grandmother, grandfather, um, died a couple years apart. But this family came back to us after... Uh, one of the oldest sons who I worked with for his parents, uh, his children are my age. Uh-huh. Uh, they had children of their own, so he's a grandfather. Here, his grandson, who's two years old, was with his parents down by Boathouse Row. It's a famous Philadelphia landmark uh, along the river as you're entering the city right by the art museum. Uh-huh. Um, for those of you who don't understand the the city layout or anything it's it's always lit up there's white lights very beautiful people get engaged and take all sorts of wedding photos there it's a place of of happiness usually Mm -hmm. um but last spring 
they were there talking with some friends and their son had fallen in the Schuylkill River and it was a particularly rainy spring. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of algae bloom on the river in that area because it's very slow. Uh, it's right after a, a, a little dam that's in the river. So it's, it's kind of a pool, mm -hmm. so to speak. But um, this poor little boy was not able to be found for quite a while. He was underwater. Mm. When they finally got him out, uh, he was rushed to CHOP, which is the Children's Hospital run by the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. here in Philadelphia, um, where he was brain dead and survived. When I say survived, he was mechanically surviving. Uh, for about a day or two mm -hmm. um, before they had to decide to make, you know, <laughs> to yeah. end, right. to end the treatment. Um, it broke my heart. Yeah. Um, it broke my heart in a lot of ways. One, uh, just to see that family come back when they shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, and it broke my heart because then you start imagining that being your son or mm -hmm. you look at them, they're the, a family that looks very much like me and my family. Mm -hmm. um, and you just put yourself there and then you come home and you hold your own baby and you can't stop crying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's basically what happened. And then you start thinking things like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive if this happens to me. I don't know how they're doing this. Uh, you, you think things like that, especially through the whole service when you're seeing them have to talk to people um, who just want to show their support. But I don't know if I could be receptive of that. I, I think I would need to just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm afraid of what would happen to me because mm -hmm. I just don't know how I would be able to handle that. I don't know how people can go on, but I think about that from time to time and I can't stop like the tears from welling up mm -hmm. you know or and I think about things in, in times when I shouldn't so say my son is like playing the piano with my mom at their home in Gettysburg or something and I'm standing there watching that smiling maybe recording it on my phone and and I get a weird thought like man and, you know and I say the family's name in my head and I think about them and I just shouldn't do that to myself mm -hmm. but I mean that's that PTSD just pulls you right back in. Mm -hmm. There's like there's like no healing from from that. But you know you have to make a a decision whether you're going to let that continue to bother you in that way or if you're going to use that to help other people. Do yeah. you know a funeral? Um, let's see, funeral directors who seek therapy. Unfortunately, there's a high rate of alcoholism in the profession. Uh -huh. um, that's not something that I've fallen into. Um, but I think there's a better, a high or a greater need for um, mental health, that, you know, concurrent with, with practice before there's issues that there, there should be, there definitely should be. Uh -huh. um, I know some people are well-minded enough to, to seek that out. I think the funeral profession is one of a lot of older people, a lot of old men who may not even believe in mental health, mm -hmm. uh, especially some of the rural, which I have a tough time saying that word. I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> um, but like the country funeral homes, I mean, you're like transported back to 1967 when you walk in the door. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how a lot of these people think as well. Um, and dollars to donuts to put in a 1967 phrase there mm -hmm. uh they're probably the the high percent of alcoholics mm -hmm. um it's a tough profession it, it it just is um and i i remember one day in class might have been even like the first day of class uh, the program director said look to your left look to your right only 10 percent of you are going to be doing this for more than 10 years mm -hmm. And I didn't, I thought, yeah, right. But I certainly understand it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I do know some of my classmates that have gone back to school to do nursing or dental hygiene or, mm -hmm. you know, just wildly different things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a high stress rate. It's 
uh, where I was working before, there's only three funeral directors. So there's 365 days a year. And we split them up between the three of us for on call. Um, It's not a whole lot of time that you're not working or waiting to work. Uh Um, You know, because you can't, you don't know when, when you go to bed, if you're going to be going back to work or if you're going to just have a, it's hard to sleep. Yeah. (laughs) Because you're anticipating all the time. And you do have those lovely families that give you a heads up with the hospice situations. Uh-huh. which do two things. It helps you know that you might be working with them, but it also uh, doesn't help you because now that's on your mind and you don't know when it's going to happen. So you're afraid to go to the grocery store, out to eat. You're afraid to go to movies uh-huh. um, because you don't want to to leave. And that, that's hard on a relationship too. Right. Uh, so there, there's a lot of life. You, you can't, you have to be a little selfless. But it, it also appears as though you're selfish uh, to your loved ones at home when you're always gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's a tough balance. Do you think you'll do this for uh, many more years? Well, uh, it's an interesting question because I actually left my full-time job last June, June 1st, mm-hmm. uh, to be a stay-at-home dad with my son. I am still licensed in Pennsylvania, and I do contract work work with where I used to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is something I, I always want to be a part of who I am. But I just needed, I think I needed a break because I was having a lot more emotional ties to things. And I wanted to be more present um, and an active parent to my son. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other side of things is my wife opened a private practice for, uh, she's double board certified child psychiatrist adult. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm helping her with the practice. So it's kind of our little passion project right now and it's going very well. So I think we've, we've made some good decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what are some, what are some characteristics of someone who would, who would do well as a funeral director? Uh, you have to definitely be compassionate. You have to care. Uh, about people and, and their feelings. I, I There are a lot of colleagues out there that I feel are rude and brash, and I wonder how they deal with families very well, but mm-hmm. I, you can't be afraid to talk to people. Mm-hmm. You certainly have to be a good public speaker because you're leading a lot of services, even just making announcements before and after. You, you have to be able to speak in a way that people can understand. And when I say that, I don't mean not have an accent or use colloquial terms. I mean, you have to be able to give direction, Mm -hmm. uh, how to get somewhere, what they should do when they get there so that they feel comfort and so that they feel like they know what's going on for the day. Um, It's very hard to lead a procession to like a cemetery because people get nervous. And even though you have your headlights and blinkers on and a funeral sign in your car, uh, other drivers will pull out in front of people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and cut, cut everyone off. The world doesn't stop anymore. It used to be that people would uh, kind of stop and take their hat off on the sidewalk when a hearse would drop by with a family in procession, but now nobody cares. They want, <laughs> they want to beat, beat the hearse across the street. Mm-hmm. Um, but you need to be able to explain to people how to get places so that if, if the chain does break on the way, they're in the know. And, and GPS has helped a lot that way, but you also have to be somebody that can handle seeing things that you never thought possible or imaginable, uh, especially different things that happen to the body in the condition. Um, you know, you can be a funeral director and not want to be a part of embalmings and get a job where you're meeting with families mostly, mm-hmm. but you can't. You can't escape the training part and the things you have to do in your internship uh, to meet the requirement and to be able to pass your boards. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have that. And I feel like once you get through that, you you can decide whether or not you want to be a part Mm -hmm. of of anything moving forward. But you you also have to be a creative thinker. Um, Just like my story with the tampon, you have to be able to use everyday items to fix problems because you're not going to open up a catalog and 
and find out find a missing nose or uh-huh. or you know anything like that. Uh, y- yes, they do have things like that, but they look terrible. <laughs> You've got to be able to uh, craft and build those things yourself and learn body proportions and uh, restorative art and cosmetics, uh-huh. um, all of those things. It, there's a lot that goes into it, and um, uh-huh. and if you find the one thing that you're really good at, then then you can be a very valuable part of the team. It doesn't really matter what that thing is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like my an old colleague of mine was exceptionally good at creating forms and, and things like that, and that's just some, something I'm not good at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like filling forms out, but I don't want to create them. Mm-hmm. And she was great at creating policy and how things ought to be handled, and mm-hmm. you know, I just really valued that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Anything else you want to share? I mean, I have so, so much has happened to me. <laughs> so much has happened to me. I have so many work stories and different situations. I, I could keep going. Um, it's, it's not so much. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, here's my little soapbox. Uh-huh. I wish people wouldn't be afraid to talk about death. Uh-huh. And I wish they wouldn't shy away from talking about death that has occurred. Um, I, I think one of the best things about myself now with all this experience is continuing to ask people how they're doing after so-and-so died. Because uh-huh. people have, have a need to talk about it and share. Um, you know, and you have to do it in a way that isn't like nosy. Uh-huh. But, you know, I have a lot of friends who lost parents shortly after we graduated high school. And whenever I see them, I just want to check in. I, I, you know, I want to better understand what it's like now that we all have children. Do the children ask? So this is a question I asked somebody I recently saw at a wedding. Say, her kids are now seven years old. They're twins. Uh-huh. Do they ever ask what happened to your dad? And she said, yes, all the time. They, they want to hear the story. And I said, and do you tell them the real story or do you guys hide or shield them? And she said, no, they know the real story. And I just thought that was great. I mean, it was a traumatic thing. Um, mm-hmm. It was a hunting accident on a trip in Alaska. Um, but, it, it, it's, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. just things like that. I think that's important. I, I was like... I left the conversation giving her a hug saying, you know, that's amazing that you're doing that. Um, we're at a wedding. Let's not talk about this anymore. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I actually just met somebody a week ago. Uh, I went over to a friend's home. I was visiting my parents and took kind of a night to see some friends. There's still friends in the area there. And I met a person I'd never met before. And in doing so, you ask the normal questions. What do you do? How did you find yourself living in Gettysburg? You know, those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And I asked, do you have any siblings? And there was a pause. And this person shifted and looked at, looked at my friend. And I was like, uh-oh, what did I ask? You know, I asked something. Like, and he said, yes, I have an older brother, but he died. Oh. And I said, well, that's okay. I said, how long ago did he die? And I said, about four years ago, it was a car accident. And I said, I'm sorry that happened. And, you know, and then I went into saying that it sh- he shouldn't. I was like, you know, you don't have to pause with me. I'm a funeral director. I said, it's very normal for me to talk about death. So you don't have to be afraid, mm-hmm. you, you know. And it, it's, I think people are afraid to mention it. They really are. Yeah. And it, it, they just shouldn't be. It's part, it's one, we have two things that, all of us in common. We're born and we all die. Mm-hmm. And in between whatever happens there, you find different commonalities between people. But those two things are concrete. And we, mm-hmm. shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid to. I mean, we don't go into a room saying, oh, I really don't want to tell you this, but Marjorie had a baby. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's just not the way it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good advice. I actually went to a uh, a conference today on demist- demystifying death and dying. Wow. Yeah, and because I, I work at a health department, and there was a lady there 
um, Deborah, Deborah Grossman, I think I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, but she was a hospice worker at the VA and interviewed 10,000 Vietnam vets right before their death. And so mm -hmm. she just learned, you know, so much from them. But, but yeah, that was the whole, you know, kind of point of that conference. She was just one of the, the keynote, one of the speakers, but was to feel comfortable talking about death and planning about planning for death and, and, and also it, it's a, it's a topic that I'm a little uncomfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but I'm, but I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to learn more and, uh, and, and not feel so uncomfortable talking about it, it. It's, it's just a strange thing because just because of our society and, and what I would really be interested in in learning more and I can, you know, do research, but I would love to learn other countries and, and how death is viewed. Um, I happen to to know that in in some places in Turkey, and I don't, I don't, I want to be careful um, by saying that it might not be everyone, but maybe the very, maybe it's a sect of people mm -hmm. still have like the home viewing where the individual dies at home. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, the li the families live in in, in one home. Mm -hmm. um, multiple generations and they have like, them laid out for a couple days mm -hmm. there and like we're talking four days and I know by the they like by the time day four rolls around it's not the same as day one yeah. but it, it's welcome in their society and it, it's part of that whole this death is real this death happened thing that I think we miss out on a little bit here. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's exactly what used to happen here, um, the home viewings and things like that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't really until after the Civil War that the embalming thing really took off. And you can kind of blame the train tour with Abraham Lincoln for that uh -huh. um, because he was well-preserved so that they could do a city tour. Um, and have people view him, but mm -hmm. yeah, bombing didn't really take off until after then, and that everybody thought that everyone should be preserved and you know for viewings and burials and, and I'll tell you what it probably did help protect some health and you know mm -hmm. Ill illness and disease spreading and things like that. but um, in today's world where we have such high technology as refrigeration it may not be as as necessary to go the chemical route but mm -hmm. people want what they want <laughs> yeah yeah i would be i would be interested to talk to someone in another country who who does funerals differently because i know when i lived because i was um i lived in panama for a couple of years and that's how they did it they had a um the the body in in, in the house for a couple of days and people came and saw uh, and paid their respects and it was yeah it was there for two or three days, and then mm -hmm. they buried it. Um, so yeah, so if you if you know someone uh, you know who speaks English, <laughs> or uh, yeah, so, yeah uh, in another you know in another country who I could interview, I'd, I'd be interested in that. Absolutely. Yeah. So or any of the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Well, um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? I, I would certainly be open to um, sort of a return to discussion if there's feedback or questions. Yeah. Um, I, there's a lot of things we didn't talk about, um, but there's only so much time. But if anyone really wants to know anything at all, is there a way to message your um, yeah. podcast? Or? Yeah. Um, uh, people can go to my website, carlena.net, C-A-R-L-E-E-N-A.net, and there's a contact page, um, or just um, connect with me on, on Twitter or Instagram, um, and I'd be happy to, yeah, to take any other questions people have and then get back with you, Anthony, because I, I, you know, I, I, we're going over a little over an hour now, and I'm, you know, I want to be conscious of your, of your time, sure. respectful of your time, but um, there's... I know there's a lot more that we could talk about in the future, so let's let's plan on that. Yeah, absolutely. If there's enough interest, the part two 
could be had as the Absolutely. sequel. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of podcasts is that you that's know, right. <laughs> we could have as many, you know, parts as we want. So, <laughs> so well, thank right. you for listening. I hope I wasn't too rambly. Um, no, this was great. This was great. Thank you, Anthony. I really appreciate you and your time. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.